Hi, good morning and good afternoon for those of you who are listening in today. I'm Trang Dolan, PacBio's Director of Emerging Applications, and I want to welcome everyone to the PacBio webinar series with today's topic focus on optimizing and confirming AEV vector designs with PacBio sequencing. So as you know, gene therapies uh, are now viable medicines that have reached the market and are providing transformative benefits, meeting large unmet needs. And although the development of AAV-based gene therapy is accelerating at a rapid pace, there are still many challenges that still need to be solved to ensure these transformative products can achieve their full potential. So, so, so today, I'm joined by three great researchers in the field of AAV gene therapy who will share their insights and current practices for developing and validating AAV vectors. Uh, first, we have Elizabeth Sang, Associate Director of Product Marketing at PacBio, who will present on how to generate and analyze full-length AAV sequencing data using PacBio's simplified software and interpretation tools. Following her presentation, we will have a panel discussion with distinguished uh, guest panelists, John Thompson from Homology Medicines and Adam Cockrell from Avanti Bio, who will talk about their real-world experiences using Hi-Fi AAV sequencing data for their important gene therapy uh, research programs. So with that, uh, let's get started. Our, our first speaker today is Liz Sang. Liz is an Associate Director responsible for ISO Seek and Emerging Applications in the Product Marketing Department at PacBio. So please join me in welcoming Liz. So my talk is brief today because I also want to spend a lot of time having live discussions with our two panelists. The goal of this webinar is focused mostly on understanding the data analysis portion conceptually of what exactly is PacBio HiFi sequencing bringing to AAV data. So first, I want to give an introduction of why um, uh, our customers have been choosing HiFi sequencing for AAV analysis. So HiFi sequencing can really support our customers through different phases of AAV. In the first phase, HiFi reads have been used to sequence tissues for novel AAV vector discovery. I will show that in the next few slides. In the second phase, HiFi reads have been used to sequence the AAV vectors during the design phase for improving vector design. The ideal use of HiFi reads in this case is identifying fragmentation, truncation events, unintended mutations, and also if using HiFi for sequencing mRNA, it can also be used to verify that the desired transcripts express. Once through the design phase, a, a HiFi sequencing can also be used to confirm that the production level of AAV vectors are also intact and correct. So let me just walk you briefly through some of the publications. The first is use of HiFi to discover a novel AAV vector. In this case, the authors used targeted sequencing. They targeted about 2.2 kilobases uh, in the vector genome to, to identify in a human sample of a novel AAV species that they named AAVV66, which had strong packaging performance and is functionally distinct from AAV2. In the second case, um, the authors were using AAV sequencing to look at truncation events of design changes using single guide RNAs. What they found was that single guide RNAs on their own don't lead to truncation, but vectors that carry dual single guide RNA expressions in tail to tail conf configurations can lead to truncation. They were also interested in looking at evidence of recombination events between the host vector and the vector genome. And the reason that this is possible using HiFi reads is because PacBio HiFi sequencing is full length long read sequencing. With short reads, AAV sequences cannot be fully resolved. And just to show the distinction between using short reads versus long reads on looking at the same data, this is a recent publication that used both short and long read sequencing to look at production differences be between using HEC293 and the SF9 platform. When looking at the gel bands, 
which are in figure A and B, they notice that the full band from ITR to ITR should be around 3.3 kilobases. Looking at the band, however, they notice that SF9 showed potential heterogeneity in the vector. When they did Illumina sequencing, which is figure C here, they weren't able to show why the SF9 production system produced vectors that had higher heterogeneity. Some of this is because short reads is not able to reveal the full length information, which means you can't tell if it's truncated and if it's truncated, how it's truncated. But also there are secondary structures in the ITR region that makes it very difficult for Illumina sequencing. Using PAC biosequencing, they were able to reveal the heterogeneity that is present in the SF9 system that was not present in the HEC-293. They also showed, which is a little hard to see here down below at the figure C, that in a focus region around the three, three, prom, UT, uh, sorry, three prom ITR of the design, SF9 showed a persistent deletion in the marked region in figure C, whereas that deletion did not occur in the HEC-293 system. All right, so let's briefly walk through the sequencing workflow for AAV before we get into bioinformatics analysis. The AAV user workflow starts with a customer designed vector. Then we have a AAV protocol which supports multiplexing. I'll show you briefly schematically how that works before we get to a double stranded adapter library that can be sequenced on PAC BioSQL 2 and 2E systems. Importantly, because the molecules for AAV could be self-complementary or single-stranded, there requires a, propri uh, not propri a special uh, bioinformatics data analysis mode to produce the correct reads to represent those structures. And that is the on-instrument AAV mode that's available in the PacBioSQL 2 and 2E systems. Finally, once we have the reads, I'll show you the high-level concept of the bioinformatics analysis, which is currently available at the command line from my GitHub repository. So let's start with the top line, top part of the library workflow. If we have single-strand AAV, then we need to create a double-stranded structure using thermal annealing for single-stranded AAV, which is shown here. If it's a self-complementary AAV, then it actually does not require thermal annealing, and we only need to add adapters on one end. And that is exactly what you see here during Smart Bell Library construction. The thermal annealed double-stranded single-stranded AAV structure has smart bells on both ends, which are shown in blue. Multiplexing is done by adding bar uh, by using barcoded adapters. Whereas for the self-complementary AAV, the adapter is only on one end. This distinction is important because the AAV run design mode on SQL 2 and 2E systems will be able to handle both molecules. So, sorry, what exactly is happening on the uninstrument AAV mode? The first is something called recall adapter, which is required for processing the self complementary AAV to output a single read that represents the unpacked self complementary structure. Let's show an example in which case this is not properly processed. Then in this case, there will be two, um, the, the, the molecule will be thought of as two strands and the incorrect molecule structure will show that the barcodes that's only on one end of the adapter will not be properly processed and the reads when mapped will be characterized as single strand AAV. Whereas using the correct recall adapter, we can now show the ITRs and the barcodes at the two ends and sample multiplexing will now succeed. The second part of the AAV on instrument mode is bi-strand CCS with heteroduplex detection. Heteroduplex detection with bi-strand CCS is required for single-strand AAV if the two strands are different species. If the HD detection mode shows that the two strands are different, the output is two HiFi reads, one representing each strand. So 
So now after the AAV on instrument mode, we have correctly processed the single strand and the self complementary AAV, which you can see schematically on the left and the right hand side here. At this step, the sample barcodes are detected and removed, and then each sample is then independently mapped and analyzed. For the remainder of the talk, I will focus on two public data sets and also a collaborating data set with a, um, with, a, uh, with a customer. So we have purchased two commercially available vectors. One is self-complementary and one is single strand. For the self-complementary AAV, I will first show you the report and then I will talk about how we actually arrive at these nomenclature. With this self-complementary AAV data set, we show that the majority of the reads, after mapping back to the vector genome and characterization, that most of them, 95.1% of them, are considered full self-complementary AAV structures. And full means that they actually go from ITR to ITR and also form the self-complementary structure as desired. We do see, however, there are some of the reads that represent partial self-complementary structures, and a very small portion of them represent the backbone or full or partial single-strand AAV. On the second data set for single-strand AAV, the target region from ITR to ITR is about 2.5 kilobases. After using the on-instrument AAV mode, when we look at the read distribution, we notice an unexpected 5 kilobase peak when the in expected insert size is 2.5. After characterization, we realize that the 5 kb peak represents a full ITR to ITR and hence close to 5 kb self complementary AAV sequence. However, we do also see the expected 2.5 kilobase ITR to ITR full single strand AAV. So these are the two public data sets that we have currently released and is available at the URL below. So now that I've showed you what the report will look like, let's come back and talk about how exactly did we arrive at these characterizations. But first I wanna describe the overarching goal of the bioinformatics analysis that I have created that the intended goal of using hi-fi sequencing for vector characterization is threefold. First is to characterize the vector genome of the sequences that actually map to the vector, including the backbone. We want to know what is the proportion of single strand versus self complementary versus something else more exotic. What is the proportion of full length versus partial genomes? What is the proportion of vector versus non-vector, the flip-flop configurations, and unintended mutations? Within the vector versus non-vector, we're also interested in the proportion of the distribution of those sequences, such as to the backbone, the helper, the rep cap, and the host genome. Finally, with full-length remapping, we can also characterize chimeric recombinations between all of these quote-unquote genomes. So let's start by defining what exactly is genome in this sense. So let's suppose that a genome is the vector that contains both the ITR to ITR target region and the backbone. I'm using the, I think this is the self-complementary uh, example here. Sorry, this is the single strand example of one to 2.5 kilobases. And so our target region is from one to 2.5. So let's say if we see some of the reads that map to the target region, these are the two black reads, how would you characterize them? What if we see some reads that map to the target region, but are not full? And what if we see some of the reads that go beyond the target region into the backbone? So in this case, my script categorizes the black reads as full, the orange reads is partial, in which case we can further characterize partial is five from partial, which means it contains the five from U uh, sorry, ITR 
and this is the three prime ITR region, or three prime partial, which is the opposite, or partial meaning neither of the ITR regions are present. We can also characterize the green reads as backbone. And finally, that was the case for single strand AAV. If we were to look at the self complementary read, it would look something like this. If we have a full read where the sequence is 4.8 kilobases, then the first half of the read would map to the target region, and the second half of the read would map back in a self uh, reverse complement to the target region. In this case, we would characterize this is self-complementary AEV full. And now I've re-annotated the three examples above as single-strand AEV. I'm not showing the partial on the backbone for self-complementary because they follow exactly the same logic. Next thing we can do now that we have fulling sequences is also to characterize flip-flop configurations at the ITR regions. Schematically, what this looks like is if you look at the regions around the ITR, this is what the flip configuration would look like versus the flop configuration. The difference between the flip-flop flop region is about 43 basis. So let's come back to looking at the workflow. We would start by mapping the reads to the genomes, where the genomes, quote unquote, are a representation of all the sequences where the reads could map to. That includes the vector, rep cap, helper, backbone, host, or it could be chimeric. Within the vectors, we will further characterize them as single-stranded or self-complementary. We can then further subtype them as full, partial, or backbone. We can also characterize the ITR configurations, flip and flop. And additional information is offered in the report, such as read length and variations against the genome. So in the final few slides, I want to show you a customer example where we are characterizing a full versus a full plus partial band. When we only look at the high level characterization of how many reads map to different parts of this quote unquote genome, we don't see a big difference. It appears that most of the reads do map to the vector. However, if we further characterize it using the type and subtype, we'll see a difference in that the full band versus the full partial band has more partial self-complementary AAV, and that it has less full single-strand AAV. We were also able to look at the flip-flop configurations. Here I am only showing it for what is characterized as single-strand AAV full. Recall that if they're partial, one end of the ITR is is missing and we wouldn't be able to uh, detect, characterize the flip-flop configurations at both ends. So in this example, I'm only showing full and we can see the full versus full and partial band, the flip-flop configurations are largely equal. So that summarizes my talk. Here are some of the resources. You could visit our webpage we have a library protocol, and then the data set and the current bioinformatics workflow is available on GitHub. With that, I'll conclude my talk and hand it back to Trey. Yeah, thank you very much, Liz, for the informative uh, presentation. Uh, I do wanna cover a few uh, questions that we got, we received through the chat window. So the first one, Liz, uh, specific to your presentation is, uh, what is the fidelity of the thermal annealing process for single-stranded AAV? 
can we have the, the, the question uh, clarify the question? Fidelity means like how often it actually anneals or it anneals same species versus different species? Yeah, so maybe we can have uh, the individual who typed in that question to uh, add some clarification uh, to that particular question, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I probably know what they're asking about. Uh -huh. um, because what happens in AAVs, you get both plus and minus strands of the virus. And so when you break it open, lyse it in solution, uh, essentially all of the plus strands find all of the minus strands. If you have uh, highly similar plus and minus strands, they're not gonna discriminate among other similar strands. Uh, now, if you have a completely different uh, central region, then they won't combine. But uh, in a typical situation where you have uh, identical or near identical strands, they will just find each other and you will not be able to take them apart by a thermal uh, manner. Yeah, I, I think in that case, that's why we have the heteroduplex detection mode on the um, on instrument AAV mode. Mm -hmm. Although I think he's asking, the, the questioner is also asking like how often this happens. We have one public data set. Um, I think that's limited information. I'd say that we have the not, we have the tools to investigate that. Yeah, no, and, and we do uh, we do that routinely and we see you know slightly different strands and you can distinguish it you, you're looking at the different sides and it's it's quite easy to do that uh, using the, the tools. But uh, they're not going to find perfect matches. They will find anything that is uh, very similar. Got it. Awesome. Thank you very much, John, for for jumping in and helping with with that question. I thought it would be a good point in time and it's a good uh, after the presentation to kind of get some of these questions out of the way related to the the presentation from Liz. So we have another question here uh, in regards to SmartLink. Um, is there a workflow available uh, in SmartLink that can process the data and generate all the results that you discussed in your presentation, Liz? That's a great question. Yeah. So unfortunately, at this point, we don't have the workflow I've described in GitHub. The the SmartLink currently supports up until generating the correctly processed reads, mapping to the gene quote unquote genomes and reports does require using the GitHub code. However, I will say this is why we're also working with FormBio. Um, FormBio is a data analysis solution in the cloud that is going to implement my code so that um, you know it, it really helps with people who don't have as much command line bioinformatics expertise. And as Liz mentioned, we do have a webinar coming up with FormBio where there's going to be additional information uh, around those analysis solutions. Um, yeah. Okay, next question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. I was going to jump in and say we're starting to work with FormBio also, or initiating some work with FormBio for the bioinformatics side of things. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, sorry, I just glossed over. Uh, what is the definition of full? Uh, does it have to include absolutely every base of the ITR, or is it just like greater than 90%? Yeah, so there is a, like every good bioinformatician who writes code, there's a default. Uh, the default is I allow up to 100 base truncation, but um, this is a completely tunable parameter. If you want to be very stringent, you could say you can't lose more than zero bases, 10 bases, 20. Um, this actually touches upon the really good questions like how I come up with these metrics or what are the defaults. A lot of times it's a combination of intuition and actually asking our customers what they think is an appropriate default. So John and Adam, uh, do you have any thoughts around that as a as a as a user and an informatics expert in this area? Yeah, I mean typically you see the full well with pack bio you see the full ITR. You will sometimes see deletions internal in the ITR. There are weird things that happen there. It's a very unusual sequence that likes to to do things that you can't understand. But uh, essentially, the whole thing is they are using PacBio uh, if using CCS reads. If uh, uh, with other technologies, you don't see the ITR, so that it's not even an issue because uh, you can't tell the sequence, you can't can't tell the length. So PacBio is the only one that can actually allow you to see if the whole thing is there and, and base by base, uh, at least uh, in our experience. I agree with that, and you could see flip flop orientations, which Liz pointed out earlier. So you can see not just you know the, what you've put into the product but essentially what what has come out in your product so not just the plasmid 
sequences that you put in, but you get all the orientations that come out in the product itself. Great, thank you. Um, another question here regarding uh, the size of the genome. Is the 2X size genome from 2.5 to 5 KB, as it, is it a result of library artifact or is that a biological issue? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, of course, this webinar, my goal at PacBio is offering as much validity we can on the sequencing side and the bioinformatics, but I do wanna uh, say that I, I don't know yet. You know, when we looked at that data set, it's, I, I, I'd i say I did a lot of due diligence to say I, I have excluded as much as possible that it is not a bioinformatics artifact, does not appear to be a sequencing artifact. At this point, the jury's still out, but I would love to hear our panelists thought on this. Yeah, I mean, the capsid uh, holds uh, typically about 4.7 KB of single strand DNA. So if you get 2.4 of double strand, that's essentially the same thing. And uh, uh, you can get concatamers uh, either in cells or uh, during library processing. It's, it's one thing you have to be really careful about is what you're doing to process the sample for um, and to make your libraries because any kind of ligation or polymerization repair can affect what was there to start with. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I mean, it kind of gets at the self, whole self-complementary vector versus single-stranded vector thing too. So you can intentionally design self-comp vectors uh, versus single-stranded vectors, of course, to to fill that size, which are about the self-comps will be about half the size. And then you can also have you know stem loop structures and stuff that form. Uh, if you have a single-stranded vector, even you can have self-comp and stem loop structures. Um, that'll add up to package that if you have strong stops, say in the middle of your vector or se strong secondary structures, I should say, in the middle of your vector. Thank you all. Um, okay, next question. Uh, see, is PacBio sequencing able to resolve single nucleotide variant? Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that's a short answer, but but the reason we, we know we can is we've applied hi-fi sequencing to whole genome sequencing, variant calling. We have very solid solid evidence there where there are uh, ground truths, such as the FDA precision challenge, where we know we can call single variants un unambiguously. Yeah, and I would just point out that, you know, one of the things with our uh, therapies that go before the FDA, they want to know what's going on with the fidelity of integration. And so, you know, typically people have used Lumina for looking for, you know, very low uh, frequency variance down to 0.1%. But if you're using, if you're looking at AAV and looking at integration sites, you can't use it because it's too short. And so we have used PacBio uh, CCS reads to get down to 0.1%. So it's essentially equivalent to Lumina and really is at the limit of how many molecules you're sequencing in terms of accuracy. And so, you know, we have validated that uh, internally. All right, uh, next question. So in addition to the fraction of full, does Liz's code produce the fraction of full that contains no mismatches as well? And there was a follow-on question to that, uh, or clarification, um, if I may. That is, that is no nucleotide substitutions in the central part. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So currently the report does show the percentage of reads that map 100% identity, so like no mismatches. I do think I have not separated them out by four versus partial. So this is great feedback. It's definitely something I can stratify to show, you know, what is what is percentage of completely pure sequences by four versus partial. Okay, great. Thank you. And I think those are uh, the questions that were um, that came up during your presentation, Liz. So that what I'd like to do now is kind of transition into the panelists. And sounds like John and, and Adam already jumped in and introduced themselves and provided uh, great feedback on their experience around these uh, these questions um, after Liz's presentation. But again, what I'd like to do is now invite all the panelists, 
uh, introducing John again. John Thompson is the VP of Genomics and Computational Biology at Homology Medicines. And again, Adam Cockrell, he's the Senior Director of Vector Biology at Avanti Bio. And so um, if, if I may ask, you know, kind of like a general high level question around this, this, this space in general. Um, you know, it's been quite impressive to see how far this field has advanced and to see all the work that has been, all the work of uh, completing the Human Genome Project uh, and how it's um, uh, attributing to accelerating these, these types of promising therapies. So I'd like to hear, maybe we can start with John here. Um, you know, what has been the most exciting thing that has happened in the field of AAV and gene therapy for you? I think just the diversity of applications now. It, it's uh, it's really spread out and, and doing all kinds of things now. I think, you know, uh, it has shown itself to be a safe uh, therapeutic uh, modality. So as a result, a lot of people have been using it and we're, you know, discovering what you can and can't do with it. And <clears throat> Yeah, I think you know, highly relevant to today's webinar. I think what's really exciting is people applying all the latest genomic technologies to understanding AAV because you know, for many years, uh, you know, you mainly looked at southern blots and things like that. That you know, they give you answers, but not good ones. And AAV is a very complex system, and you really do need these very advanced uh, genomic technologies to really get at what's going on there. And to me, that's the most exciting thing. And I think that. You know, it's not just pac bio, but lots of other technologies that are really being applied and will help us understand what's going on here. And it, it will make it a lot easier to approach lots of diseases that, you know, have been unapproachable in the past. And to me, that's really why we're doing this. Thank you, John. And what about you, Adam? What has been uh, the most exciting thing for you uh, in this field? Uh, very similar. I mean, it's uh, just seeing the fact that we have what I would consider the most complex, probably drug product on the market, and having two of those drug products licensed for you know genetic applications and genetic ther for correcting gen uh, genetic deficiencies, uh, Zolgensma and Luxterna, I think is um, to me amazing. And I've personally seen some of the patients, you know, that received Zolgensma walk across the stage when I was, uh -huh. uh, you know, working with Avexis and Novartis. So that, to me, that that was, I, I think, the most amazing thing to see. Um, but there's clearly a lot that we have left to do um, with such a complex uh, vector product. And from from my perspective, we need to, you know, using Pack bio using other technologies to understand what we're producing is going to be really critical and in getting into the kind of the weeds of actually what's in these products and being able to use that information and iterate our vector production process and make a better uh, vector and better therapeutic that can be used in the future. Well, it's definitely inspiring. So thank you very much for that. Maybe this question is for you, Liz, and in, in this very similar vein, as the product owner of AV sequencing applications at PacBio, what led you to developing these workflows for customers? Yeah. Um, really, it's no. Well, actually, I want to first say that I came to the AAV space as a bioinformatician and you know an employee employee of a sequencing company so i had very little um vectorology or gene therapy experience but what i really appreciated was the excitement of you know just the promise of what uh what gene therapy can bring and i'm even more happy that you know long range sequencing can be a part of it um the bioinformatics co really bore out of neat necessity you know um we create products that customers demand and our analysis is part of that product so when we had we knew that the, the long range sequencing can deliver answers but there's one step be between uh, receiving those FOSTA sequences to a report that can be interpreted and when customers started asking you know what does this mean um, I started working with our customers and I'm very grateful for all of the customers who are willing to share some of that knowledge and sometimes even their data sets with me confidentially to help me create code that can be used. Awesome, thank you very much, Liz. 
Uh, one of the questions that we typically get asked um, in this space is that there, you know, there's a combination of short reads, long reads, and even synthetic long reads um, technologies that are out there. And even with long reads, you have PacBio long reads versus ONT long reads. So uh, maybe we can start with John here again. How did you decide on using PacBio long reads for sequencing AAB? And uh, if you can just give your thoughts on, on, on how it's different from some of the other technologies. Yeah, because we actually have uh, all three systems uh, up and going uh, at homology. So we have PAC bio instrument, uh, we have lots of uh, nanopores, and we have a MySeq. And we use each of them for particular purposes. Uh, and obviously, Illumina is a short read and lots of reads. So if you need lots of reads on something, we do that, you know, for counting things. But if you want to look at, you know, the sequence of the whole AAV or the sequence of an integrated AAV in the genome, you need to have long reads. You need to be able to span that long distance to make sure that, you know, uh, the variant you see at one end of the molecule is on the same or a different molecule than something you see at the other end. So you really need to see it. And as I mentioned before, with the ITRs, you simply can't see them with the other technologies. You, you just can't read the sequence. Whereas with PacBio, you can, and, and that's important. And as I mentioned also with fidelity of integration, we want to look at, you know, are there any errors introduced when we recombine AAV into the genome? It's critical, but, you know, the homology arms can be, you know, hundreds to up to a thousand bases long. You have to span that whole region. You want to make sure that that homology region is part of the integrated DNA. So you have to be able to get high quality sequence across the whole range into both the payload and into the unique genomic region. And again, you need to have uh, a high fidelity uh, sequencing system to do that. There are times where we just need to, to see how long something is and would use Oxford Nanopore for that. If it's like, okay, this is 5,000 long and includes the payload and you know the, the genome region, but we don't really care what the sequence is because we're just counting you know, how often does this happen. Uh, but if you care about the sequence and often you do, uh, you, you have to, to, to go to pack bio. Yeah, that's great, John. And if I can add on to that question uh, and build on that a little bit, there's been a lot of discussions at a lot of these conferences around integration, but integration of AV into the host. Does any of these technologies offer any advantage to assess how or the mechanism of action of how certain AV vectors get integrated into host cells? Yeah, that's certainly something we're looking at right now because, you know, we'd love to see high levels of integration. Uh, we, you know, we see sometimes, you know, 5% or a little more, but uh, in some diseases you need a higher efficiency and uh, we need to understand that process better. And again, knowing exactly what's happening at the sites of integration is critical. You know, what bases are there? And sometimes what we'll do is use homology arms with uh, variants uh, sprinkled throughout the homology arms so we can tell where the crossover is actually occurring. And again, you need to know those exact sequences. You can't uh, be having errors there and because that would throw off your crossover region. So that you know, we have a, a lot of work going on where we're researching you know, what helps and hurts integration and making sure that it is on target rather than uh, anywhere in the genome because that's obviously critical as well. And uh, again, we need long read sequencing for the off-target integration as well to make sure that you know, if if we see it, that uh, we know exactly where it's happening and what's involved. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, maybe this question uh, is for for Adam. So Adam, I know that you're you're new to uh, PAC bio sequencing, but I know approaching some of these um, AB sequencing and, and these projects can be very daunting. So maybe you can give a little bit perspective of you know how you actually approached. Um, uh, doing AAV sequencing and, and why you chose uh, PacBio as the solution for that? Yeah, I think so. It's really the question I think that you're asking. You know, how you start with asking, what do you want to achieve with you know with with your sequencing? And for for us, it's just understanding what was being packaged into the particles, right? So are we getting full length? Are we getting partials? What percentages of those are we getting? And then the deeper dive, are we getting backbone? Are we getting products from other plasmids being packaged in there? Is it reverse packaging or is it some chimeric forms that we're getting? So in order to understand all that, we like John was saying earlier, you have to know the end to end of every molecule because if you don't, 
then it just looks like, yeah, you're getting some of this and some of that, but it's not clear. It doesn't tell you what's happening. It doesn't give you any indication or any insight into the mechanism that might be occurring. And in order to understand or in order to go back and make corrections, you have to have an understanding of what's happening on at the molecule level so that you can go back and determine how you can make changes mechanistically when you develop the vector uh, and redesign the vector so that you won't have that happen. For instance, if you have, you know, if you have a promoter in there that has a strong sequence secondary structure that stops every time and it's creating you know, truncations and a lot more partials that are getting packaged, you might need to change that promoter or you might need to modify that particular sequence in, in that promoter so that you don't have that anymore. So to me, it's for our purposes going back and, and it's all about vector and, and really product design, to be honest. Um, we're not doing integration. So our goal is a little different than homology. We don't want it to integrate. <laughs> So we're we're very we're very happy if it doesn't. <laughs> and we're not we're, we're not so worried about off target. It's, it's not integrated. <laughs> but well, so uh, it's great to have customers that look at both. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> they're all important. At this, they're all important. <laughs> That's right. All right. Uh, a question around uh, the the assay itself. Uh, do you have a plan to resolve homopolymer issues that is commonly seen for pack by results? Maybe Liz, we can start with you on this one. Um, so this is a question from the attendees is like about, I'm just trying to clarify about re issues with resolving homopolymers. Yes. Do you have a plan to resolve homopolymer issue that is commonly seen in pack bio results? So maybe, the, maybe the, uh, the person who asked, asked the question can just, um, type in a clarification question, a clarification around that particular question, if you would. Yeah, I, I, I do think maybe the question is generally. Um, addressing like, you know, are there concerns? Maybe I'll, you know, generalize the question. Is homopolymer using well, pack homopolymer is, is, a, is a source of error. Um, I would say that was probably indeed the case when you know, I've been a pack bio for 10 years, when we first started. I would say over the years, we've really, really improved our consensus call, our CCS consensus calling for resolving homopolymers. Of course, it homopolymers are probably still one of the hardest things to correctly call but i have not seen that being an issue especially in aav which is to, to my knowledge does not have uh, a lot of homopolymers but that might not be the case okay and this is an informatics question so it's probably going to be directed at liz and, and adam on github uh, you recommend using essentially default parameters for running minimap 2 is that better than using PBMM2? <laughs> That's such a specific technical question. No, there's not really a lot of difference. One is, this person really knows. A PBMM2 is the Minimap2 wrapper that PackBot produces. There's really no difference. Yeah. Okay. And then a follow on to that same question from uh, the same uh, attendee. Should one try using more stringent than the default read quality threshold to make sure that the non mismatched data reflects the input sample, but not the sequencing errors? I'm not sure. I, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what exactly this person is. I think it's referring like, should we filter out the reads? Um, yeah, maybe I have to ask for clarification. I will also say these questions, use the GitHub issues to file them. I can definitely like have a more detailed discussion there. Yeah, and for the attendees on the line, you know, uh, if we can't address your questions directly on this webinar, we are certainly going to be following up and sending responses directly to you uh, at the conclusion of the webinar. So if there's anything that you'd like to further clarify around your questions in the chat window, then please do so, and we'll make sure that we'll get those addressed and then get those, those answers out back to you. Uh, next question here, um, let's see. Uh, I'm wondering what is the difference between the by strand and the HD finding option in the CCS function on your command line, and what's your recommendation on which one to use? Thank you. It should be both. Um, I'll again, I can clarify that later just to confirm what we actually, what parameters we're actually using in the AAV mode. I know I write it in my own wiki, but I haven't looked at it in a while. 
All right, uh, next question here. Is there a way to uh, quantify sequences with SmartSeq in the context of screening CAPSID libraries? That's a good one. I don't know if confirmative, affirmatively, is that something we could also ask if the panelists have any thoughts on this? Thoughts on that? Quantifying sequences with smart sequencing, well, with hi-fi sequencing. Yeah, I think it would depend on exactly what the person was doing. Uh, and there are lots of ways to screen caps the library. So I, without more information, I couldn't answer. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so maybe a, another question just to kind of expand on these um, uh, informatic questions. And uh, maybe we can start with, with, with uh, Liz here. So Liz, when you're thinking about informatics, which is, you know, can be daunting for a lot of customers, how did you approach the informatics for AAV and what were the gaps? Um, I feel like that's a, it really is also quite a great question for our panelists because I'd like to hear their point of view. Um, I think if, if if you see the way I structure this informatics workflow, it's really coming from the answers point of view, right? Like the customers are more interested in what exactly are is the data telling me and what, how did you come up at, at these percentages in these tables? So I start with the endpoint is asking your customers, what do you need? What is the question you're asking? And how do I arrive at that answer for you given my knowledge of informatics and given your knowledge of um, you know, vectorology. For example, I did not know what a flip-flop was until someone showed me it, <laughs> you know, sent me the papers and like, here's your flip and here's your flop. I'm like, once you've explained that to me as a data scientist and bioinformatician, I'm like, oh yeah, that's very easy. I know exactly what to do to get you your flip and flop, you know. But why they're flip and why there's a flop? No, but I'm not an AAV expert. <laughs> Adam, anything you want to add on top of that? Um, I'm not a bioinformatics expert, that's for sure. And that's why I collaborate with Liz as far as the bioinformatics expertise and why I'm collaborating or trying to work with, um, or we, we are at Devante trying to work with Form Bio too. Uh, but yeah, I would say um, I would add to it, get a good collaborator that's a good bioinformatician, which is very hard to find, by the way. So I think that's been, you know, the the big one of the biggest challenges that I find is um, is the bioinformatics side, and I think one of the things that if we're if the field is going to move down this direction to using this technology is it has to be reproducible, and they'll have to be kind of we'll have to figure out how to how to set parameters around this technology so that it can be used for the purposes that it might want to be used for by the FDA or by whoever for quantitative purposes. Because if we don't have those parameters set up and we don't have it qualified, and you know, a validated type of assay, it's going to be very tricky to try and use this. It's still going to, it'll be mostly, it'll remain mostly a research tool unless we can, you know, get batch to batch. So if you have two batches of vector and we look at them, we want to make sure they're the same, you know, based on how we look at it with PacBio. Um, that, the, all of those things in my mind are going to be critical to how this technology gets utilized going forward. Or does it stay kind of at the research level, essentially? And I don't know if I answered your question, but Again, I'm not a bioinformatician, going back to the basic question, um, but I, I enjoy the collaboration with Liz. She, As she said, with I, I think we're one of the people talking about um, the ITRs <laughs> and the flips and the flops, and we've worked with her on, on you know, getting some of those things uh, organized for us and, and working out pipelines, bioinformatics pipelines. Yeah, no, certainly that's helpful, and it's glad, you know, it's good to hear that there are other tool providers that are um, stepping forward and creating these analysis tools, but maybe, John, maybe you can shed some light on this. I mean, as an early adopter of the technology and looking over the horizon when maybe some of these informatics tools didn't exist uh, while you were using PacBio to sequence AAV, what, how did you approach informatics, and, and what were some of the gaps that you, you, you and your team had to fill? Yeah, I think it's you know the same problems as that as Adam did only sooner. Um, you know, we uh, had a pack bio instrument and 
you know, we didn't have much expertise in using it. Uh, and uh, uh, so we hired a consultant to work with us to help get at this. And again, it's, it's helpful to, to bring in someone that is an expert. And, you know, over time, we've also brought in uh, people, you know, with bioinformatics skills, but uh, it's very hard finding them in, in the wild. Uh, so that, you know, we train them when they're here because, you know, when we put out ads, you know, we want you to have uh, informatics expertise and pack bio, Oxford nanopore and alumina. And guess how many people we get? None, <laughs> because there aren't any except uh, the ones that have been here. And uh, so it, it's a challenge. And uh, I think you have to go in with the understanding that it's a complicated situation. Uh, you really have to think careful about what you're putting in there, run lots of controls. Uh, because weird things are going to happen, and uh, it's the case with any sequencing system. I mean, it's not unique to pack bio. Uh, there are things that happen that you don't immediately understand, so you got to run lots of controls and look at the data carefully. Remember what you're doing during sample prep and library prep, because those can all affect things. And uh, it's, it's just got to be careful to uh, to follow what's going on, because it's it's very easy to make mistakes. We certainly have. I made our fair share and uh, learned from them. And I, I think that you know, that's the key is uh, making sure you're very careful and that you uh, double, triple check everything uh, so that uh, you know exactly what it is that you're looking at and, and what it means. Thank you. And I, I think the next question is really around, you know, as this field be, uh, continues to emerge and um, the demand for AV sequencing kind of grows. You know, what are kind of your recommendations in terms of like sequencing AV internally and, and bringing the technology in house versus using a service provider to do the sequencing for you? What are kind of your thoughts around that? Maybe we can start with John on this one and then move over to Adam. Yeah. Yeah, so as I said, when I actually, when I started homology almost three years ago, we already had an instrument, so it wasn't really a question, you know, should we go outside or inside? And I'm glad we had an instrument because it allowed us to do a lot of things you couldn't do with a provider. So, you know, we you can, you know, dig into the uh, uh, the weeds to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, we're, you know, we have fought with uh, Pack bio customer reps over the years saying we still want this feature don't take it away we want to be able to get in and look at the, the data uh, don't make it too simple because uh, you know it's a lot of information there that we want to get and uh, pack bio folks have been really great working with us to help uh, help us get out the information we need because we don't want just the sequence we want lots of things because there's a lot of information buried in there that uh, you don't want to lose and if you have you know, if you just send your sample to someone else, you may not get that information. You won't even know that information exists. Uh, so it's it's been very helpful. As I said, I mean, it's been great working with the Pack Bio folks because they have helped us uh, uh, do things that we couldn't have done on our own. Thank you, John. And how about you, Adam? What do yeah, you think? I, I reflect the sentiment about working with Pack Bio, um, especially. I got to give a plug to Liz here because we've worked real closely with her. So yeah, I, I would I would say the same thing. Um, I think that the deciding, we're, we're outsourcing most everything right now, but we are outsourcing everything. Uh, we don't have the tech, we don't have the capabilities in house. I think it's great if you can afford to have the capabilities in house um, from a cost standpoint and from, uh, standpoint of being, you know, having the personnel to run the instruments, having the personnel to do the bioinformatics, I think that's a, a team effort to some extent. So, you, you know, in my mind, there's like three phases with this, which is the wet lab phase, you know, setting everything up and then the, and then the phase of sequencing and then the phase of doing the analysis with the analysis taking the longest, probably of all three of those. And you have to have that entire pipeline in place in-house if that's what you want to do so it's it's it requires a lot of effort to have that in-house it also requires a lot of effort to actually outsource it too because then you have to maybe go to different places to do these things and that's what we're finding ourselves uh having to do um but it's the path as you as you kind of go through it the path becomes clearer and clearer as to where you know we're starting we could see some light at the end of the tunnel as to 
um, how we can get to answers that we want to get to because it it what's really a bummer is when you're sitting on a pile of data and you know the stuff is there but you don't know how to get to it and you're looking for the right people to help you get to the answer and I think that's um, yeah so that that that's my ch the challenges so cost time you know the usual challenges whether or not you bring it in house. Yeah, I, th I think Adam raises a good point. It, it's not just the cost of the instrument and the sequencing, it's the people to analyze the data. And uh, those are hard to come by. And it does take a fair amount of resource uh, to make sure that you're doing it right. Thank you for that. Um, so we're approaching the top of the hour. Maybe what we can do is close on a final question for our three panelists. Um, and so I'm going to keep it really general. Um, so, so John, what does the future hold? I mean, what are you looking forward to in the coming years around AV sequencing and AV-based uh, therapeutics? What does the future hold for you? Um, yeah, we want to understand everything about AAV and uh, you know what happens when you make it, what happens when you stick it into cells to either you know get integration or not. Uh, to get you know tissue specificity, to you know basically have control over every aspect of it, so that you can do the things you want to do. Right now, uh, a lot of what we do is determined by um, editing efficiency, by tissue specificity, uh, different things that uh, you'd like to be able to fix. And I think that you know as we understand more and more about the system, we'll be able to. Uh, adjust those to what needs to be done for the diseases that are really uh, affecting people. Adam, what does the future hold for you? Hopefully designing, you know, the Cadillac of therapeutics that, you know, of AAV therapeutics that can get to, I mean, I pretty much reflect what John said, getting to the tissue, the cell type and everything that we want, being, you know, and correlating transduction, with what's being packaged and back to the starting product that you're, you know, you're starting with. So having that, being able to take all three of those steps and and being able to know that what your outcome, the phenotypic outcome you're getting uh, is controllable by what you're putting in, I think is the most important. And that it's reproducible. I think reproducibility is gonna be a big deal moving into the future. And Liz, what's the future hold for you from a product perspective? What sorts of improvements are you looking uh, to offer customers in sequencing AAV? Yeah, I also want to extend that we're a long range sequencing that doesn't just sequence AAV. We sequence the RNA, we sequence the genome. We can look at the you know results of the genome editing in the in the host. So I'm excited to look at what long range sequencing can do as a tool for the gene and cell therapy world as a whole. Awesome. All right. So with that, I'd like to close this webinar by thanking Liz, John, and Adam for their time today and for sharing their expertise and experience in AV sequencing uh, and analysis. And with that, take care and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.